This, thank you, ma'am. Um, does everybody hear that or just me? When she says it's recording. Everybody? Yeah, okay. Let us pray again. Look with pity, O Heavenly Father, upon the people in this land who live with injustice, terror, disease, and death as their constant companions. Have mercy upon us. Help us to eliminate our cruelty to these, our neighbors. Strengthen those who spend their lives establishing equal protection of the law and equal opportunities for all. And grant that every one of us may enjoy a fair portion of the riches of this land through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. With that, I'll give it to Stacy. Thank you. This will be a very quick transition. We have a great program this morning, and I am going to turn it over to Jen to introduce everybody. You're on mute, Jen. I'm never muted, so I guess it was a godsend for a minute, huh? Anyway, good morning, everybody. I am so so happy to introduce ECS, who is one of our main partners. And I have been with them for about six years now, meaning I have been their liaison and they have wonderful programs. And as Stacy has mentioned, um, this, this formation is about outreach and it's outreach month. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our presenters and that the first one is our new CEO of ECS, which is Elizabeth Fitzsimon. Elizabeth, and then there is Andrea Murrow, who is part of community development. There is Rachel, who is part of CERC. There is Kendra. Kendra is the um, co-manager of CERC and the other program with the Safe Haven. There is Christina who is part of our safe haven. If you guys don't know where the safe haven is, it is only a half a block from our cathedral going south, uh, north. And then there is Rachel, Kunja, Christina. And did I miss anybody else? I think I got everybody. So Elizabeth, who is our new thank CEO? Yes, thank you, Jen. Thank you for the invitation uh, this morning and really thank you for your leadership um, in, in support of ECS. Good morning, everyone. Happy Pride Month. Um, it is such fun to be with you here at the forum, uh, which I have participated in, but I have never spoken to. So it's a great honor for me. So thank you for having me. And thank you all for your support and your interest in learning more about ECS. Um, it's really great. I'm just scrolling through the screens and it's so good to see your familiar faces, which I haven't seen in a long time in person. And I look forward to being back at the cathedral in person. I think we're all kind of working our way towards that. This is such a time of tradition. Um, and uh, I think it, it might be me in my family holding us back because I have to say I really have enjoyed listening to everything, um, you know, on my on my headphones, walking the dog or eating breakfast. And I don't have to get dressed or put on makeup, but I did today because this is really important. Um, and I remember one day I logged into the 8 a.m. service and everyone had their cameras on and they looked so nice and I was still in bed. So I will get there though, I will get there. And I just wanna give a shout out to Maya, little Sonia, who has done such an incredible job with Sunday school because I've got my three kids, uh, two in the, in, the, in the little kids group and one in the teen group. So. Uh, that has been such a great adventure and she has been so imaginative and innovative. Um, but I think that we're all getting a little zoomed out and we're ready to come back to in person. Um, so soon I will, I will see you all back at, at the cathedral. And <clears throat> pardon me, as Jen mentioned, I'm new to ECS um, and I see our, um, our retired CEO, Leslie Keller on the meeting as well. Hello, Leslie, good to see you there. Um, and so I've been at ECS now about two months, and I have to say from the very first day, I felt like I had come home. And it's funny because I was telling Rocket Ewell the other day, that was how I felt when I found St. Paul's, that I had, I just knew that I had come home. And I know many of you can relate to that feeling, right? I see some nodding heads of that searching and then that finding 
And what an incredible feeling of relief and serenity that is to find your place and your people, right? Um, and that's how I feel at ECS. It was the perfect alignment of what the organization needed right now, what I wanted, and very importantly, a match of values. At ECS, we share the same values um, that we have at St. Paul's and in the Episcopal Church. We welcome all, we serve all, and we want all to have what they need to feel supported and to thrive. Um, for those who aren't familiar, um, ECS provides early childhood education and care, drug and alcohol addiction treatment, and homeless transitional housing. We're based in National City and we have 22 locations across South Bay, East County, and San Diego. We have 450 employees dedicated to inspiring children, empowering adults, and transforming our community, serving 7,000 children and adults per year. And we do all this through um, an operating budget that, that is three, I'm sorry, $30 million, much of that government contracts, and the rest of it is philanthropy. Um, it's, do it's donors at every level, from modest donations to large bequests and everything in between, who really enable us to provide these critical services to these 7,000 individuals that I just told you about. And you know, after the year that we've had with so much loss um, in our country and in our community and so much um, suffering uh, you know, due to the pandemic and the long overdue reckoning with the systemic racism in our country, the work we do here at St. Paul's and at ECS is needed now more than ever. So I wanna tell you about the vision of ECS. It's a community where all are supported to reach their potential. And to me, that is what the beloved community is all about. The beloved community that Dr. King talked about, where everyone is welcomed, valued, and given the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. So at, since my first day at ECS you know, in early April, my focus has been on learning as much as I can about our people, our programs, our clients, and our partners. And adding all that learning in together, what are the possibilities ahead for ECS? And I have learned that our amazing team members, um, a few of which are online today with us this morning, no matter what their role is, they feel just deep pride in their work and a connection to our clients and our community and they know they're making a difference. And the love and the kindness and the acceptance they showed to our community is really special. It's what sets ECS apart. Our team members are making a huge difference in some pretty pivotal moments of life with little people who are just starting their lives all the way up to grown people whose lives have hit some pretty serious turns. And I have also learned in my listening tour that more people across the region need to know about the great work that our team members do. And I've learned too that the more people know about ECS, the more they want to support our work. And that's gonna be a primary focus of ours, raising awareness of our work in our community. The more who know, the more who support, the more partnerships we can create, and the more opportunity we have to make an even greater impact on the lives of our neighbors in need. And I see such great opportunity for partnering with the, partnering with the churches in our diocese, tapping into the strengths and the passions and connections that we all bring and making an even deeper impact together. So looking ahead, I see ECS as being a top tier charity known across the region as a cause worthy of support because of that deep impact we're making where it's needed most. And I see ECS as being a leading voice for equity and a convener and coalition builder in the nonprofit community, really a driver of social change and public policy. I see ECS as a leading voice for low income children and families and those struggling with addiction and homelessness. And I see ECS as making a lasting positive impact on the people we serve. You know, carrying across generations, not just now, but across generations, and really helping to break the cycles of poverty and addiction. I see such a bright future for ECS and the community we serve, and we are here today looking for ways that we can partner with you. Um, in partnership together, we can achieve so much, and several of my colleagues are here with me today to share more about our programs um, that are changing lives and creating opportunity in the community, and um, so I can't wait for you to hear from them. And I invite you to 
send us questions and get involved. And I'm going to turn it over now to our development director, Andrea Noor, to take it from here. Andrea, please. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I want to say hello to Leslie as well. Um, I had the great fortune to work with Leslie for three years, and so it's nice to see her face. Um, and it's really lovely to see so many familiar faces here on the Zoom um, that I've met over my time working with Episcopal Community Services. Um, a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me, um, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. Um, I actually attend St. Dunstan's, I have my whole life. Um, and my parents were married at St. Paul's. So I feel very connected and close to St. Paul's um, personally, as well as in community with Episcopal, with ECS. Um, so thank you so much for having us here today, um, just to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, I, Elizabeth mentioned that we do have a budget of approximately $30 million um, through government contract, and it's funded through government contracts and also um, philanthropy. And so um, one of the things that one of where we started to make a shift a couple of years ago was um, putting a little more emphasis in growing our philanthropy. And um, in order to meet the needs of our clients where they are um, and to provide additional ongoing services over and above what um, our contracts will uh, support. And, you know, the contracts come at a certain level. And then, you know, we feel we want to go the next step. So we do that um, through philanthropy. And so our, our fundraising and our development um, takes many forms. Um, we have some uh, grants that come from uh, family foundations or from corporate foundations, which help to augment um, some of our needs. We also do special events. I know many of you have attended our gala in the past. Um, both virtually and our hybrid. Um, and so thank you for that, because that raises very necessary unrestricted revenue for the organization. And the other part that we do is through individuals. And so, and through our partners in ministry, um, which is not only the Episcopal Diocese, but also um, other churches um, within other um, communities within San Diego. And there's many ways that they uh, we engage our partners in ministry. Um, I'm sure all of you have received over at least once a uh, letter from us asking for you to, to, per, to be a partner in our philanthropy. Uh, and even, even if that isn't something that resonates with you, um, I, I encourage you to take a minute to really read those letters because the people in the letters are actual real clients of ECS. And so they tell their story and talk about how their, their lives have been changed because of the support that we've received, because of the support we receive um, from individuals and, uh, and through others. So at the very least, it is a very good way to, to learn about what's happening at ECS and um, and throughout the organization. And each, each letter is, is a different person, um, you know, so, you know, take some time and just learn who it is that we are really um, helping and assisting um, in the community. Uh, when we talk about our partners in ministry a bit, that's a little bit uh, with Elizabeth and working with our congregations. I have to say that St. Paul's is one of our um, most, our closest and most connected um, partner in ministry uh, with regards to supporting both our CERC program and our Uptown Safe Haven. And um, prior to COVID, uh, you all, uh, St. Paul's was um, a participant in our um, our, Friday, our Thursday lunches um, at our CERC program and at our Friend to Friend program. Um, over the years, St. Paul's has stepped up during the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays um, to provide gifts and a really lovely holiday party um, for our clients. And so we are so grateful for that. Um, and because it really is meaningful to the, to the people in our programs. Um, and I know that, you know, Christine and Kendra and, our, or Kendra and Rachel are shaking their heads because um, you can, you, you hear the gratitude um, from the clients uh, with regards to your support. 
The other program that you're, you support very heavily is Uptown Safe Haven, and that is one block across the street from the cathedral. And especially during uh, this time of the pandemic, um, people from St. Paul's have been great about dropping off um, homemade cookies and treats and games and coloring books and um, things that you wouldn't think would be that important, but have been incredible. I just had the best time the other day just talking to um, Stanley over there and he was telling me how much he's enjoyed the homemade treats and the opportunity um, for people to come and visit is something that they're looking forward to again mainly because you know it brings them a sense of home and that other people are thinking of them so um, all of these little things that maybe don't seem so significant really do add up to something that is much bigger and greater um, for the people in our programs. And so for that, we thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I know in the past we have had some volunteer opportunities, but with the pandemic, we had to take a little bit of a break, obviously. Um, but we are in the process of recreating our volunteer program and what that looks like. Many of you knew Di know um, Deanne Rios and um, she unfortunately left ECS and, and it was so perfect for her to um, go to work with the diocese and with um, Good Samaritan, Church of the Good Samaritan. Um, but we miss her deeply because uh, she was she was great at um, all of these pieces. But we have taken some time and we've recently got a new person and he hasn't started yet, but his name is Angel Labara and he starts on June the 21st. And so we'll be looking at, you know, re developing our volunteer program. He'll be reaching out to, um, you know, different congregations to, you know, begin to solidify and formalize and, and enhance our partnerships that we've already had. So um, lots of fun new things are happening in that regard. So um, be on the lookout for additional volunteer opportunities. Um, but for the time being, if you, you feel like you might want to take some cookies over to Uptown Safe Haven or um, send some cards or coloring books. I know that that is something that they would be incredibly grateful to have. Um, that being said, again, since we do much of what our work does centers around our philanthropy, um, you know, consider making a gift to ECS. It, you know, I know many of you already do. Some of you are already in our um, Legacy of Hope Society, which is our, um, our planned giving uh, legacy gift society. So thank you for that. Um, but do consider making a gift or um, supporting the agency, however is most comfortable for you. Um, and again, just when you get the letters, just read them because I think they really warm your heart and know that St. Paul's is, has been a, a key piece in, in what you're reading. So um, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna turn that back over to Jen. Um, and then, because I can't remember who the next person is. <laughs> um, and um, that will be Kendra. Good morning, everyone. So happy to be here. Thank you so much for all your support over the years, um, specifically this year. I'm Kendra Moore. I am the Associate Director of Housing and Clinical Services. And I'm really excited to be here with Christine and Rachel. There are two program managers that work at two of the places that we were just talking about at ECS. And if it's okay, I'd like to share my screen and maybe share a PowerPoint with you, if that works. Okay, let's see. Make sure everything works here. It says host disabled. Can the host maybe allow me sharing privileges? I, I just did. Thank you. I hope I did. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about housing and clinical services and all the difference that we make as a community for those most vulnerable in our community. So we're going to talk about two of the programs um, that we feel that you have the most impact on. And the first thing that we wanted to do, we talked about it as a management team and even spoke with some of the staff 
So one of the first things that we wanted to do was just kind of take a minute to take a deep breath and thank you for all of your service um, to our programs, specifically during the pandemic. Um, we have been on the front lines um, ensuring that everyone, no matter what the pandemic um, was causing in our community, that everyone who was really vulnerable and had no one in their lives to help them could understand what the pandemic was. We kept the lights on, we kept the doors open, and we, we slowly explained to people exactly what was going on. It was very challenging for some of the people that we serve. So we just wanted to start by first thanking you so much for allowing us to be here and talk about the just the authentic truth of what we go through every day. And then also thank you for everything that you've done to contribute to making the people that we serve lives, you know, so much better, but our lives too as staff, because it's it's your contributions and and that that hope that you carry when you show up with your cookies that makes all the difference for us to come back the next day, right? So the first program we're gonna talk about is Uptown Safe Haven. Here's a really nice little picture of our back area where many of the people who um, are residents there um, are able to garden and you know, get their fingers into the earth and start to appreciate those little things that you don't have when you are um, uh, unfortunately you know, living without shelter in our um, community. So this is something that just kind of brings back that, you know, that special place. So also looking for any types of, if you just donated a plant and um, people that are staying there right now could take care of it, just having that connection um, to taking care of something and something being, you know, beautiful and meaningful about the earth to them. It's something really special. So this is why we chose this particular picture. To tell you a little bit about the program, this program is a full service partnership. We partner with another program called um, Downtown Impact, where I actually worked for about 13 years as the director there. And what, what they do is serve people with serious, persistent mental illness, people who have experienced some of the most intense trauma that you can imagine, um, trauma victims from childhood with adverse childhood experiences in their in their past and really struggled. Um, everyone that lives there, and this is right down the street from, from where you're at, um, everyone that lives there is over 18. So it's adult mental health. And it's it's people who were diagnosed with um, you know, severe depression, who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder or a diagnosis of schizophrenia and are, you know, living with. Um, a mental illness and, and trying to learn how to cope and trying to learn coping skills on how to, you know, integrate into our community, how to, you know, find a higher purpose and meaning in their lives and, and ensure that at the same time, they're getting help psychiatrically, physically, and then our housing program here that provides that safe, supportive environment where they can finally call someplace home. Um, so at least uh, these are these are people. It says at least one inpatient psychiatric hospitalization in the past year. Um, when I was working there, I can tell you that there are clients that currently live at Safe Haven that I that I've helped place there that have had up to fifty hospitalizations in one year. That type of impairment is what we're looking at with the people that you're serving at at um, our Uptown Safe Haven program. Our funding is, is, this is kind of how we break it up. We do have some MHSA funding, that's the Proposition 63 funding. Um, and we have some San Diego Housing Commission funding, which helps us to pay some of the, um, the rent there. So each room has a little bit of Housing Commission funding to make sure that our, our um, people with unsh our unsheltered community are, have a roof over their head and a place to call home. Um, and then the 7% fundraising. So um, just to be honest, that has to do with just, you know, making sure, you know, the bills are paid and things like that. The extras that you have provided, because I've been there, I've, I've been a part of working with Christine this entire time and just seeing people, you know, show up with, you know, Easter baskets and things like that. You know, those types of things are, are even outside of this funding. Those are the things that make all the difference in someone feeling, 
you know, care and consideration and, and feeling like they mean something to this world. So, and that's an extra part of the fundraising that we do. And here's a photo of Safe Haven. You probably drive by it. Um, just want to make sure that you know what we look like, that in there, that magic is happening, right? Things are, are happening in there that people's lives are being changed. And I'd like to introduce Christine. She is, Christina is the program manager who has really done an amazing job before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, she's really stepped up to the plate and made sure that we could continue to serve the clients that are living in this home. So I wanna turn it over to Christina, have her talk a little bit about everything that she does at Safe Haven. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, my name is Christina Zeman, and just like Kendra said, I am the program manager at Uptown Safe Haven. I've been there since, I've been with ECS since I'm um, about 2015, and then I came up to Uptown Safe Haven around 2017. Um, this is an old picture of Uptown Safe Haven. We have flowers in the front, <laughs> in the front of there now um, that the clients actually take care of. And our neighbor next door, he paints and he does little upgrades to the front of the house sometimes with the client. So, but the goal of Uptown Safe Haven is to provide our clients with daily living skills, structure, and safety, um, and to prepare them once they secure permanent housing through our FSP, which is Downtown Impact, to live on their own. Um, the clients normally stay at Uptown Safe Haven around 18 months. Due to the pandemic, um, we do have a few that have been there close to two years. Um, and we're slowly working with them to um, provide them with, to secure their permanent housing. And Downtown Impact is doing a great job with that. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know, but Uptown Safe Haven is not a drug-free facility. Um, however, we do um, push for abstinence. And when we do have some clients who find themselves struggling with um, drugs and alcohol, we recommend them to our other ECS program, which is CERC. And we've had a couple of people who were recommended there who actually completed the program and um, are doing great. And we have a couple people who attend the program just off of a need space, you know, and they actually enjoy going to CERC. Um, a regular week, a, a regular month at Downtown Impact, we do um, weekly meetings, um, art workshops, we do meal or group therapy. Uh, we have monthly barbecues, which I love, they love. <laughs> we all enjoy the barbecues. Um, we're getting back to, we're gonna start getting back to doing more um, field trips. Um, we used to do Balboa Park or we would go to the movies or um, whatever the clients thought about, you know, we would make that happen. Um, and so now that, you know, the world is starting to open back up, we are definitely going to, start doing that again. Um, I'm proud to say that um, during the pandemic, Uptown Safe Haven did not have one case of COVID. Um, and that was really due to the diligence of our staff and our clients um, working together to maintain um, health and wellness at the facility. Um, now that our clients, our staff, 90% of the facility is vaccinated, um, people are continuing with jobs and school um, and just getting back out there and, and, getting, and getting back into the world. Um, I would like to thank 
you all for everything that you guys have done. And I know that they've said, you, you may not understand how far your gifts and your contributions go, but it means so much to our clients. And just, just as Andrea said, it's a sense of home, the homemade cookies. And we say this a lot, but they're really good. They're really, really good. <laughs> But um, the gifts that kept our clients busy, having to stay cooped up in the house 24 hours of the day was not easy for any of us. Um, and especially with our clients' um, diagnosis, um, it made it a little bit harder. Um, the full service partnership Downtown Impact would normally come and visit our clients the nurses, the case managers four times a week. That stopped and then we moved to telehealth. Um, telehealth was not the best for our population. So us, the staff at Uptown Safe Haven kind of turned into, you know, um, the case managers and the therapists and which is not, <laughs> which is not, you know, in our, in our area of expertise, but, um, through it all with you and your support, um, we all made the difference and our clients today are great. I can also say that 99% of the clients there are sober, um, which is amazing, especially through the, the pandemic. Um, and now that they're able to be out and about, they're still, you know, working their programs, working and going to school. But just to wrap it up, I would just like to say again, thank you for everything that you guys do. Jen, you are amazing. Thank you so much for everything. Um, and it means, it means everything to our clients. And we're right across the street. So you can, get, you know, we, we're not taking visitor visitors, but you guys are always welcome to come over and, you know, have a walkthrough, um, drop things off or whatever you like, but we are there. Thanks, Christina. I just wanted to say there were two questions. And one of the questions was, um, do you have to call first if you wanted to bring something down the uh, safe haven? And we answered, no, you can, there's always a staff member there and they can just knock on the door. So. We ex you accept anything, right? From brownies to cupcakes to <laughs> yes. uh, Funyuns and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, and enjoy. just to let everybody know too, there's a list on Amazon too because these guys love junk food. They do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and then the last question I have here too is, you guys have room? How many people? How many clients normally live at the facility? Normally there, um, we um, service 19 clients and, but through the pandemic, we kind of brought that number down to keep every client in a room by themselves. Um, but now um, since, you know, vaccinated um, and things, good things like that are happening, we're going back up to move to full capacity to 19 clients. Okay, great. I think I want to say one thing and correct me if I'm wrong, but during this whole pandemic time when everybody was in lockdown, you guys did not have any breakout of COVID, did you? No. no. So that's pretty, that's commendable. I, I just you. wanted to share that with everybody because to have everybody who is mentally ill has, you know, has their own issues and to be stuck together for almost a year. Wow. <laughs> but yeah. The best thing yeah. is that you guys didn't even have any incidents. So kudos no. to you guys. No, thank you so much, Jen. Uh -huh. Jen, if I may, I just wanted to share with everyone that what, you know, I made a visit um, to the safe haven a, a few weeks ago and met with Christine and her team and the clients and was so struck by the environment there. It's um, the team has just created an environment of love and compassion 
And that results in such trust that they have in the ECS staff. There's an enormous amount of trust, there's accountability, and there's also everyone is on a path and they are all working towards something, right? And the team there is, you know, helping them prepare to kind of, you know, leave this um, nest, right? Um, and it's the ba most basic skills, you know, doing your laundry uh, on a regular basis, uh, putting money away, you know, saving money, uh, learning how to budget for groceries. Um, it's all of these things that we, we can kind of take for granted, but the staff is there setting these people up for success. So when they leave, they have a really good chance of that continuing that trajectory. And um, it's just such a wonderful environment and incredibly um, no cases of COVID. So wonderful job, Christina and team, thank you. Great, I have one more question and then we'll go back to um, Kendra. How do you get the referrals for clients? We get our referrals through our full service partnership who is Downtown Impact. Um, so with those criteria that Kendra posted, they, they come through Downtown Impact and they call, um, they'll set up an interview. And it's very, very rare that we don't accept a client. Um, the only thing that would probably make a client not be able to come is, is violence, mm -hmm. um, anything violent. But other than that, um, we accept we accept the challenge of anybody. Great. Yeah. And I also wanted to say one more thing too, is that you don't kick people out. There's not a long, it's not a timeline where you have six months and you got to get out, right? No, 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 no. We don't do that at all. Yeah. The, like I said, they normally stay um, 18 months, 24 months. Um, and by that time, they have gained the skills that they need to be on their own um, with the support of Downtown Impact because even when they move out and, and get their, uh, their housing, Downtown Impact does not um, stop working with them. It's a continued service with them. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Kendra, I'll turn All it back right. to you. All right. Do you need screen sharing again? Yes, please. Okay. Let's see. I think you have it. Okay, I do have it. There we go. All right, you see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Christina. So now we're going to talk about Central East Regional Recovery Center. And I'm really excited to introduce our, our fairly new program manager. She was our quality assurance manager for about over a year. And she started as an SUD counselor. She comes to us, I wanna mention that she comes to us from um, Veterans Village of San Diego. She served veterans for many years and we were really fortunate to have her at ECS. And she has recently been promoted to our program manager at the CERC facility. So I wanna introduce you to her and she's gonna tell you a little bit about um, what we do at CERC. And Rachel, are you here? I am, thank you so much. Good morning. Hello everyone, my name is Rachel Hakuelo. I am the program manager at um, Central East Regional Recovery Center. And um, I just wanna say, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you for um, having me here today. And I also want to say thank you for, um, you know, for the years of contributions that you all have given to us. Um, I have, ex I have uh, had the honor to experience one of those um, Thursday luncheons that uh, Andrea had mentioned. And, you know, um, like Kendra said, you know, it's the little things um, that really, uh, impact our clients, you know, being able to um, sit down to eat with, um, with, uh, you know, with everyone with, you know, the program manager and the director and the CEO. Uh, I remember Leslie being there at one time. And it's the little things that, um, that count the most and that um, when the pandemic hit and 
and they weren't able to to have that. Um, it was it was um, yeah, it wasn't very nice. But um, we look forward to having that again. Um, anyway, so um, Central East Regional Recovery um, Center is an outpatient program that provides um, substance use disorder um, services. Um, we have, um, we do it through um, an assessment called the ASAM, the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, and that is to determine what level of care that, um, the, that our clients are gonna be coming into us. Um, we do have intensive outpatient. We do have outpatient, uh, um, just regular outpatient. Um, we do provide case management services. We also provide mental health um, services and referrals. So if a client comes in with a mental health um, disorder, um, we don't necessarily um, we don't necessarily let them know that we can't provide services for them. Um, you know, because our mission our mission at ECS is we're serving God by serving those in need, and so by serving those in need, we are going to provide those referrals to those those clients who suffer from mental disorders. Um, we also have referrals for uh, medication assisted treatment. That's um, for those who, um, who need to get on any other medications to help to assist with their cravings or to assist with withdrawals. So um, in order for them um, to maintain um, coming to our, our our agency, our program, you know, to attend those groups, to um, attend those individual services. Um, we also collaborate with um, many recovery residences throughout um, throughout San Diego County, and um, you know, these recovery res residences, um, like Christina said, you know, provide a roof over our client's head um, to provide structure um, so that they they can do the things for themselves um and 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 not worry about where their next meal is going to come or not worry about if they're going to sleep underneath the bridge or not worry about um you know um how they're going to get through that day also we have um sorry if i'm talking too fast <laughs> there's a lot of services that we provide <laughs> Also, when a client has 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 completed their treatment, we also provide uh, we offer recovery services, which in recovery services, um, um, recovery services is like is once a week. Um, but through the recovery services, our uh, my staff, our staff um, assist our clients in. Um, um, you know, assisting them through, you know, getting job placement or finding housing or, you know, finding, um, you know, ways so that they could become self-sufficient. Um, that we also have transportation assistance with bus passes so to get them, uh, to get them, you know, to the places that they need to go to. It's been my honor to, work with the staff at uh, Central East Regional Recovery Center, because like it says, recovery is possible. Our staff at, at ECS, um, throughout all the programs at ECS, the main goal is hope. Hope is the main goal. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I want to tell you a little uh, a little story about one of our clients that we provided services for here at CERC. So this this client was um, was a long time uh, substance use uh, abuser. The, his family was a substance use abuser. I mean the whole his whole life, he was in and out of prison. He, uh, he had come to us um, many times, you know, because he knew that he knew that our doors were always open, that we welcomed anyone regardless. I'm sorry. This gentleman through our 
through our Prop 47 uh, grant was able to obtain permanent housing. He got married, he works two jobs, he completed our treatment, and he also, uh, he also was able to get his tattoos removed to where he could present himself um, with his head held high and walk with his back straight. And this is what, this is what our agency is trying, is, is, is promoting to have, we have compassion and we have empathy, but we have hope that we want to get over this stigma of, of um, that anything is possible. This man broke the chains of the, the, the path that he was in for many, many years. He broke the chains and that's what we're about. We want them to break their chains. Um, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> recovery is possible. Thank you. I, you know, I, I, I didn't have anything prepared. I just wanted to speak from my heart and that is from my heart. And I'm so honored to work with ECS, um, you know, because, you know, like Elizabeth said, you know, we know, I know that I was meant to be where I'm at today um, with CERC, with ECS. Um, Anyway, <laughs> thank you. So, yeah, I'm going to turn it back over to Kendra. I just wanted to give a little, um, a little, a uh, little story where we're at over here. And um, I, again, I want to thank you all for um, for all the contributions throughout the years. And I also look forward to that Thursday uh, lunch meeting with you all. Awesome job, Rachel. And you know what? You run that program with love and care and excellence, yeah. and and that comes through. Thank you so much for being here this morning and just giving everyone a little taste of what your team is all about. Thank you. I'm so proud. It. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I'm, I'm telling you, we were all kind of six feet distance, but we were jumping up and down in the lobby when we were celebrating that particular um, person's story. And really what, you know, what we're talking about is generational trauma. You know, we're talking about, um, you know, breaking the cycle of a lot of pain, you know, um, hurt people hurt people and um, hurt people do things that they normally wouldn't do their, you know, their spirits are pure and we're able to provide services to transitional age youth at CERC, you know, from 18 to 26. Um, for instance, when someone gets out of the foster care system um, at 18, uh, the the funding is no longer there. And many times they end up homeless at a shelter and they will come to us and we'll be able to put them in a recovery residence home and then provide them um, substance use disorder treatment and uh, trauma services and mental health services. So we make sure that we get their lives on track. So we're serving clients from 18 and up. So we have elderly clients also. And imagine, you know, we have a huge amount of, um, if you look at some of the San Diego statistics about, um, you know, suicide attempts or even completed suicides, we're seeing a lot of that impact on the elderly. So making sure that we're providing services for people who never had a drug or alcohol program, but as life changed and life goes on and, and they became elderly and people, um, you know, slowly um, left their lives, they faced many challenges in their lives, and sometimes alcohol is a part of that. So making sure that we're serving, you know, is, is the main thing that we do. And, you know, Rick amazing with that. Christina has been amazing with that. All of the leadership, one of the reasons I come to ECS is because the leadership is what I would call servitude leadership. It's a theoretical approach to leading that has always been a part of my heart, but doesn't always fit with an agency. And it fits with my values and it, and it really fits with ECS, meaning that we are here to serve um, and the mission is in our heart. 
And what we've done, even if it's, you know, sometimes we have these technical therapeutic, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've done, you know, you know, very intense therapy over the years with trauma victims. And sometimes that's what we're doing. And sometimes we're just handing them the food that you donated. Um, so I wanted to put this picture up here that, you know, we continue to serve and thank you so much. Um, I know there were people dropping off food at CERC. You would not believe the amount of food that we gave out during this pandemic and we're still giving out. Um, giving, and then also like gift cards, giving someone a $20 gift card, those gift cards are all spent on food. People are utilizing those gift cards for food. So, you know, that's something that we really welcome. We don't, we're, we don't get funding from the County of San Diego for anything like food. Believe it or not, you can't fund food in this particular program. All of that comes from people like you. So I just wanted to put that out there. And then, and then we wanted to share. You should be able to share. Sorry. While you're working on that, Kendra, I'd just like to remind everybody on June 17th is our annual meeting for ECS and it's at five o'clock. We put it in the chat and if you'd like to register and, um, oop, there you go. Okay. And then I wanted to share this lastly, I wanted to share that um, at ECS, we have lots of heroes. We have COVID hero, I mean, Andrea, what she has done for us over the pandemic, I've worked so closely to, um, she just kept things coming in for the people that we serve. Our, our vulnerable populations didn't go without because of who's behind the scenes, who's on the front lines. You know, we were masked up and, you know, um, giving out, um, you know, the holiday gifts that were donated, things like that. These are all things that were important. So what happened is at Cirque, we created what we call the Starfish Award. And the Starfish Store, I just want to share it with you. I'm sure you probably heard it. But I just want us to maybe, you know, wrap up our, our Sunday um, uh, outreach with the Starfish story, because this is what kind of difference you make. So an old man was walking on the beach one morning after a storm. In the distance, he could see someone moving like a dancer. And as he came closer, he saw that it was a young woman picking up starfish and gently throwing them back into the ocean. Young lady, why are you throwing starfish into the ocean, he said. Well, the sun is up and the tide's going out, and if I don't throw them back, they will die. But young lady, do you not realize that there are many miles of beach and there are thousands of starfish? Well, you cannot possibly make a difference. And the young woman listened politely, then bent down, picked up another starfish and threw it into the sea and said, well, I made a difference for that one. And that's what we do. Um, I When I first started doing this 26 years ago, I was going to save the world. And, um, you know, I'm humbled to the fact that I can only do what I can do. But I want you to know that you can do what you can do. And, and, and you make a difference in the lives of the people in your community. You may not always get attention for it. You may not always get noticed for it. But I just want you to know we notice at ECS. And finally, we talked about it as a leadership at CERC and Safe Haven, and then we talked to some of our staff, and we wanted to, if it's okay, we wanted to highlight Jennifer Dow. She has, Jen, you have, I, I want to really take a minute because the staff, the clients at Safe Haven wanted you to have the Starfish Award. Oh, so thank you. Recognizing you this month as the Starfish Award, getting the Starfish Award and saying thank you for everything you've done. Um, you have just been an amazing liaison and you have what you what you do. I mean, even just your your just authentic self and making sure that they have Funyuns if they ask for Funyuns. <laughs> I'm like, I want to bring strawberries and fruit, but they want the Funyuns and you make sure that, that happens. So we just wanted to give you a round of applause and say thank you and that the, the clients really appreciate you. I thank you. And it's with the support of uh, St. Paul's community too. So I want to pass that on to them too. But yeah, I, ECS is close to my heart. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And, you know, 
the clients and everybody, it's just helping others. And it's just about true love. And St. Paul's really gives that to them. So thank you. All right, well, I think we're almost out of time here, but I have a couple minutes for any questions or if not, anything from our speakers today, anything else we'd like to add? The only thing I'd like to add is we, we really, it's really challenging to come here and not say a big hello and gratitude. Thank you to Leslie, who I see out there. And so Leslie Keller, thank you so much. We really miss you. Um, we're carrying on your mission and your heart, but just wanted to say thank you so much. I just want to thank you for coming today and taking your light and putting it up on a stand and not hiding it under a bushel basket. You've done so much. And it's such an important sense of community. The world needs that. Um, and this may sound frivolous, but I remember pre-pandemic, you know, the ECS parties, the water and the wine. I mean, that struck me as such a way of um, people, the community coming together and um, raising money for such a good cause and having fun. And, you know, Episcopalians love parties. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just wondering now, you know, in the pandemic when people have been suffering from isolation, as that raises, can that be integrated more? I mean, you know, to, you know, it sounds like the barbecues are a real success. Maybe this is the time to kind of, uh, you know, at least when safe and appropriate, have these gatherings yeah. and, you know, raise funding for these uh, just so important causes and giving you know, a sense of community and in the context of servant leadership. Thank you, Barbara. You know, pre-pandemic, we used to do Monday, Thursday with mm. uh, the clients. And then we would have our monthly, well, we didn't, they have a monthly luncheon and that was at friend to friend, but now we're doing it with Cirque. And we had um, Bob, Bob Carney is the one who, who does the um, organizing of it, but we would do, either a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas luncheon. So um, last year we donated and collected a lot of stuff for Thanksgiving dinner, I believe. Yes. And there were turkeys right. donated and they, we were collecting for the side dishes. So, um, so there's, there's gonna be lots of different opportunities now that things are opened up. We might even do a barbecue together, a co co-facilitated barbecue or maybe an ice cream social or something, but those are in the works. And definitely it's very important for us to, to, you know, for other people in our community to learn and to meet the safe haven folks. Indeed. All right, great. Anything else? I think we're at 10 o'clock. Jen, just real quick, uh, or for anyone, if you're on the call and you want to get involved or make a gift, who do they contact and what do they do? Just write them out to me. Just kidding. <laughs> we will put, I will, we, I think there's a link. Andrea, did, can you put the link in and chat? Sure. Yes. Anybody who would like to get involved is happy. Um, please call Andrea. <laughs> Um, or you could go online and I'll put the link. And what I could do too is for this week, I'll put it in our e-news too. And then I'll put your contact information. Perfect. All right. I can't, I can't type under pressure or. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Do it now. Hurry, hurry. Just I kidding. know. I'm putting the link. I got to do another plug for social media. If you're not following us on social media, that is a great way to keep track of what we're up to and, uh, and to find ways for you to get involved. So if you're not doing that, I added the links into the chat. So please uh, click on those links and open those up in your browser and then you can follow us and stay tuned. And you could also even be invited to join the board of ECS. I am on the, I serve on the board currently and on my third year and I'm their treasurer. Don't know how that happened, but you know, I love money, <laughs> but there's a lots of opportunities and you know, ECS, like I said, is dear to my heart. So I appreciate all you guys coming today and speaking on behalf of ECS and
letting everybody know who ECS is. So thank you. I appreciate it. And so does Thank us. you, Jen. Thank you, St. Paul's you. family. So great to see you this morning. Have a great day. Thank All right. you, everyone. Thank you, guys.